Um, well, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm incredibly honored and grateful to be able to reconnect with the color group. It's been a big part of um, my career and a big part of how much I enjoyed being in Cambridge. Um, and I want to start by saying I hope all of you are well and safe and that uh, the new year is going to be better than the last one. Um, I'm already much more optimistic than I was yesterday. Um, but anyway, I'd like to um, just for this talk really review some of the work we've been recently doing looking at color deficient observers and trying to characterize what the actual experience of individuals are that have color deficiencies and how much that actually differs from normal trichromats. Um, I don't need to tell you all this, but when I'm introducing color to my undergraduate students, I often start by telling them that they don't have to take my word for it how important color vision is because it's actually something that the British government has quantified in the annual television license. And um, <clears throat> I first learned about this when I was a postdoc that you actually had to pay for a license to watch TV and it seemed like a lot of money back then. I remember there's one point where I thought to myself, you know, do I want to watch TV or do I want to get my kids a Christmas present? And I ended up putting a license in their stocking. Um, but if you look at this, um, I actually went yesterday and said, whatever happened to this license? And I was shocked to see that it's apparently still, you still have to do it. And the current rates I got is it's 157 pounds 50 if you want to watch a color television and 53 pounds if you want to watch black and white, even though I don't know where anyone would get a black and white TV now. Um, but the thing that's always amazed me about this, I don't know how they come up with this amount, but if you compare them, it's almost exactly costing you three times as much to watch a color television. And that's um, quite remarkable that someone, some British bureaucrat realized the real value of having three kinds of cones and the extra information that that could get you. Um, there's something even stranger about this license, which apparently is also still true that um, if you look on the back of it, you get a discount if you're blind. And back when I was in Cambridge, yet you only got a pound 25 off if you couldn't see the television. Now it's, you get a 50% savings. But that still means in England that it costs more for a blind person to listen to a color television than it does for a sighted person to watch a black and white TV. And that just seems completely <laughs> crazy to me. That, um, <clears throat> that's so crazy it makes Brexit sound like a good idea. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, um, it's obviously vision is much more nuanced and there's lots of ways that people can vary in their visual sensitivity. And I actually really literally did call up and ask, could I get a discount if I was a colorblind? And they told me they don't have a reduced fee for that. Um, but it's not just facetious. I think it's a really um, fascinating to question to ask if we were going to charge someone to watch television in the UK who was a dichromat or anomalous trichromat, what would be a reasonable um, discount to give them? And what I really wanna to argue today is that that's an, actually an incredibly fascinating and important question that could tell us a lot about what it really means to see, I think. And you could base that basically on many different ideas, like we might just wanna base it on what their actual sensitivity is. But if we thought in fact that their perceptual experience was much richer than that sensitivity predicted, then maybe they shouldn't get such a big discount. So anyway, these are the questions I'm gonna be um, talking about today. And I wanna start actually almost with an apology because even though I've studied color vision all my career, I've actually done very little work in color deficiencies. And I know I'm speaking to a group where it has just enormous expertise in that and much more than I do. I've spent most of my career looking at normal um, trichromats and I'm actually really interested in how individual differences in color vision and how the visual, how those differences are actually calibrated. And so it's embarrassing to admit that actually it took me a really long time for it to dawn on me how incredibly powerful a model is of using color deficiencies as a way to look at the very questions that I was interested in. Um, and so anyway, as I talk about this again, I'm a little intimidated to speak to all of you experts about this and I feel like I'm telling you things that have, a lot of you have been thinking about for a very long time and were obvious from the start. And me telling you that it's important to look at color deficiencies is I think sort of the equivalent of being the last person to recognize who won the US election. 
And maybe I, the second to the last, because Pence is supposed to do that later today. Um, anyway, those are the questions uh, that I want to look at. And again, I've really, um, just over time, just really been intrigued by what a beautiful model system this is for asking really general questions about vision. And there's a lot of reasons. The first is that we know that at first, a lot of the variants of color deficiencies are really just happening in changes in our losses in the photopigment. So it's really just at the very first stage when the light's being absorbed, where otherwise the neural circuitry we think is all the same. And so you can really have a very well-defined simple change right at the beginning of the system and then ask how the rest of the brain can adjust to that. You also know obviously that there's many different kinds of color deficiencies and they're extremely well characterized both in the sensitivity and the genetics. And so that allows very precise predictions about what kinds of um, responses you might expect and whether there are compensations. Um, the other thing that's particularly important to me is I've studied adaptation processes a lot, how vision changes when you're exposed to different situations. And this is sort of the best case I can think of where you have a very well-defined change that people have had a lifetime to adapt to. So it really lets you look at these adaptation processes really at their practical limits and much longer than you can in the lab. And finally, um, there's very many different ways that people have characterized color deficiencies and the capacities they have for seeing and experiencing color. And that really, I think, is very powerful because it lets you look at sort of where do we see compensation being manifest and where do we not. And that only can tell us about things about the nature of plasticity, but also about the um, nature of the kind of color measurements we use and whether they're informing us about actual sensory processes, for example, or more cognitive processes. Um, so I want to go through um, those ideas again. Um, a lot of this is really drawing on the enormous amount of work that you and many others have done. Um, but the four parts of this is first, I want to emphasize that the idea that color deficient observers are compensating isn't really surprising and it'd be more surprising if it wasn't because these kind of calibrations and compensations are just a normal part of sensory processes. And so I'll first review that quickly and then look at specific examples where people have actually demonstrated this compensation. And then I want to look at the relationship between the very long-term adjustments that we might be measuring when we're looking at an individual's had a lifetime of a particular cone complement versus the kind of short-term gain changes that we typically study. And then finally, some work where we're starting to look at sort of what are the possible limits? How far could you, the system, go in theory to actually correct for uh, color loss? Um, so anyway, just to start again, the idea is that we all know that the visual system itself is incredibly adaptable. So if you simply stare at the center of these four squares for a few seconds, then very rapidly, each part of your retina is adapting to the average color. And you see these vivid color after images. And again, I've spent a long part of my career really doing that exact same experiments, but just putting different stuff in each of the squares. And I'm still amazed how similar those properties are and how you adapt in very similar ways to many different attributes of the world. The other point I, I try to make, um, and me and many others, is that these adaptation effects are not just sort of curiosities in the lab, but they're really built into the fabric of sensory processing. They're very strong in natural context, and we very clearly are strongly adapted to the particular properties of the environment that we're in. And so, for example, with um, John Mullen, we looked, for example, at the color variations in natural scenes. And those can be quite um, constrained. And so this is a scene, for example, that's varying between blue and yellow. And we showed that you adapt not only to the average color. So if we just showed people samples of these scenes on a monitor then, then tested their color appearance, you see not only changes to the average color. So on average, this distribution might be yellow, but over time it will look gray. But you also adapt to the variance or the gamut of colors. So over time, you lose sensitivity to the dominant variation in the um, color distribution and become less sensitive to that blue-yellow um, axis. And you can even see this if you look in things like uniform color spaces. So here I've just taken the Munsell palette and projected it into the cone opponent uh, space. And you can see that there's, these are supposed to be equal perceptual steps, but they look very elongated in terms of the cone contrast. 
And this suggests that we're less sensitive to the sort of bluish orangish directions and other di color directions. And that's very roughly consistent with the fact that natural scenes tend to vary primarily along bluish and yellowish directions. So it's consistent with the idea that because there's more variation in the world along those axes, the visual system is calibrated to reduce the sensitivity or sort of sphere these responses. Now, another thing that um, has really fascinated me is often we think of adaptation as being adjusting an observer to a change in the environment, but the same processes are probably even more important for adjusting different observers to the same environment or compensating for your own idiosyncratic visual system. And there's many studies that have looked at this. Um, so really beautiful work by a number of people, including Jack Werner, who's looked at changes in vision with aging and shown, for example, that as you get older, the lens gets more and more yellow. And if you didn't adapt to that, then older observers should see the world as yellower. But in fact, if you ask them what their color percepts are, and there's also nice recent work on this by Sophie Berger, showing that in fact, their color percepts are very similar to what younger adults experience. So they've adapted out that physiological variation. And we had done a study with Jack um, and Peter Delahunt where we actually looked at that in patients with cataracts. And what we found is right after cataract surgery, you suddenly boost the sensitivity of short wavelength light entering the eye. The world looks really blue and bright, but over time they slowly adapt. And so they're recalibrating. So they're basically seeing the color the same way, even though it's now with a very different visual system. Just again, showing that the way you see color just depends on the properties of the environment that you're exposed to. And you see the same kinds of things calibrating not only changes over time, but changes over space. So if you compare, for example, the fovea versus the near periphery because of the macular pigment, the surrounding cones see much, get exposed to much more short wavelength light than um, the foveal cones. And again, if you didn't adapt to that, the, the near periphery should look much bluer to you. But if you actually measure color appearance in the near periphery, it remains mar remarkably stable. And again, there's a number of different groups that have shown this. Um, but we've also shown that not only does what looks white to you in the periphery remain very similar, but that also remains the neutral point for adaptation. So if you now just ask, what stimulus would I not get a color after effect to? That's the same physical stimulus in the fovea nearby periphery and not the same retinal stimulus. And from that, we think that this is a calibration that's actually happening right in the receptors that they have not only these ability to adjust very rapidly to short-term changes in the color environment, but that's riding on top of a very much um, longer history of stimulation that's calibrating their sort of intrinsic response. Now, um, last point before I get to color deficiencies is that it, this is also not at all surprising because there's very many theoretical reasons that people have put forward for why the system should adapt. And one I think that's very powerful at early stages of the visual system is just the idea of coding efficiency. And you would really need to adjust the responses of the system so that they're matched to the range of stimuli that you're exposed to. And very many people obviously have um, use that idea, I think, to make incredibly powerful predictions about visual coding. And color is a really good case where many people have noted, for example, that the LM cones are strongly correlated in their responses. So that'd be a really inefficient way to just keep their signals separate. And to build more efficient codes, you basically want to decorrelate those responses by having, say, post-receptoral cells that respond either to the combined signals or the luminance variations, and then take the difference to respond to the chromatic variations. And when you do that, you're left with the problem that the, because of this really strong correlation, the contrasts provided by the chromatic system are very low in terms of cone contrast. And so you'd wanna amplify these signals. So you're using the same dynamic range of the system to represent color as luminance. And there's very many sources of evidence that suggest in fact that you are much more sensitive to these small chromatic variations in terms of the cone contrast than you um, are to luminous. Um, and um, again, this suggests that the way you actually experience color shouldn't depend on what the raw cone contrasts are, but what your, how your visual system is matched to the gamut 
of colors in the environment. And one way we've looked at this is just to show people noise patterns like this and say, just adjust this stimulus so it looks like it's varying as much in color as it is in brightness. And so they can manipulate that in different ways. And people can actually do this task. And if we plot what they say is a balanced stimulus, in fact, that's very roughly related to the contrast that you actually measure in natural scenes. So again, how colorful the world looks to you is really just a matter of how colorful the world is. Okay, so given that background, again, the main point is that these are just really universal processes affecting not only color vision, but everything you see, and they're going to affect you, whether you have uh, three cones or two and what the spectral sensitivities of those cones are. And so with that, we can start to think now about what we would expect to see for someone who had a different form of um, color vision. And again, that's something that very many people have done incredibly beautiful work on. And um, many people have noted, for example, that if you were just to simulate the color losses of an observer, for example, an anomalous trichromat, then one way you could do it is just reduce the signals that are provided by the LNM cones. And so this doesn't may not have the actual color directions they'd experience, but it has sort of the color contrast. And again, this is really saying that this is the loss in information that you're getting from the more similar spectral peaks of your longer wave cones. But this image here doesn't really describe at all, I think, what the actual perceptual world of these individuals are because it doesn't take into account the fact that they are adapting. And if you simply allow the system to adapt, then in principle, it could recover much of the original color variation that's in the present image, just because if you've lost the um, LM signal, you could just amplify that at post-receptoral levels. And that's the basic idea here again, is that if you just think about what's information's lost at the level of the cones, you predict that you have very impoverished LM sensitivity, but if you allow the system to just adapt again to match its dynamic range to the range of cone signals it's getting, that predicts that you should recover um, some of that information. Now this has been looked at again in very many studies, so many that I can't list individual authors, but um, I think the main point I wanna make is that we're still very far from understanding exactly what's going on, to what extent does the system compensate and what are the different forms of compensation. And so for example, we know that in some tasks we see in that um, color deficient observers look almost like normal trichromats, particularly if you ask them to name or label colors. And whereas in other tasks, it might be tapping more kind of sensory or performance limits, they don't um, typically respond as well. We also know that there can be very many different mechanisms involved, and these can involve everything from the kind of adaptations, effects that I've been interested in to very different things like recruitment of rod signals or taking advantage of the retinal inhomogeneities of the eye. And again, they can involve a lot of perceptual and cognitive factors. So it could involve like learning and things. They may not necessarily see the world differently, but they could in principle learn to label it in the same ways. And also another big mystery I think is um, when we actually look at these effects, they're very widely from one individual to the next. So there's an enormous um, variation in individuals that even when they seem to have the same sensitivities and we can't really predict their performance from their actual, um, what we might know about their cone sensitivities. And I wanna highlight in particular, a really beautiful review of that by Jenny um, recently that talks a lot about those issues. Um, well, if we think specifically about gain changes, then there's been very many studies that have specifically focused on that and this idea that if you just had a reduced input, say, to an L versus M channel or mechanism, then that cell itself could just amplify its gain to try to um, re recover the output, even though the input is reduced. And again, there's very many people who have explicitly um, talked about that idea. And here's um, one really nice example. There's a study by Ali Bain and Jenny Boston and Don McLeod, where they use basically similarity measurements of different colors and then multidimensional scaling and compared that for color normal observers and anomalous trichromats. And if you look just at their sensitivity differences, again, the thresholds for the anomalous observers are much higher. So you'd predict that their 
L versus M color signals would be much weaker. And their sort of perceptual space should be really flattened or show very little variation along the LM axis. Whereas when you actually look at the um, similarity ratings, in fact, they're showing almost as much importance or salience for the L versus M direction as um, color normals are doing. So this is, suggests really strong compensation in this case. I want to talk about a specific study where we've recently been looking at similar things using a hue scaling task. And in that task, basically what you do is you just show a series of different colors. And then for each one, the observer just has to break that down and say, what proportion say of red, green, or blue, yellow do you see in this particular stimulus? And um, use that as a measure of their color percepts. And then you can take those percepts and basically represent them instead of a in the cone opponent plane in sort of a perceptual space that corresponds to how red, green, or blue, yellow it looked. So in our studies, basically, if you thought something looked an equal mixture of green and blue, that we'd represent that by an angle of 135 degrees. And again, we we actually have done. Um, more studies than I care to admit on this with color normal subjects now. Um, but we've recently extended that to color anomalous observers because we wanted to compare them in this task. And so um, these are the thresholds or basically the threshold ratios of L to S um, sensitivity for normal versus anomalous observers. And um, I think the differences in this case were um, quite large. And then these are the hue scaling functions. So again, as we're varying around that color circle, this is just showing the percentage of red versus green or blue versus yellow that um, people are reporting in that. And if we just look at the average hue scaling functions, we're get, seeing that most anomalous observers are using the full range of colors, but there are significant differences even at the average um, level. And we can take these hue scaling functions for each individual and from those kind of work back and say, well, what stimulus angle corresponded for them, say, to a pure blue or yellow or to like a um, balanced orange or things like that. And so we can reconstruct their unique hues or binary hues. And that's shown in this mess here, which basically the outer, the triangles are color normal observers and then the um, circles and stars are the anomalous observers. And they're in similar locations in space. Clearly they're able to judge all of these colors, but there are significant differences between them for most of the different hues. Another thing we can do with this data is just try to measure the relative salience of red, green, and blue, yellow responses in these observers. So for this, what we do is basically fit a um, red, green, or um, blue, yellow kind of, each of those lobes are sort of half of a sine wave. And we're, this isn't meant to be a model of what we think's going on, but more just a measure of how strong is the red and green response. And from that, we can say, what are the axes that the red, green, and blue, yellow are tuned to, and how strong are they? And so this is showing that we can use that to fit individual anomalous observers. And we can also compare that to the threshold to the red, green, and blue, yellow responses we predict if we just rescale the normal observers according to their threshold losses. And that's shown, sorry, that's not very clear in the dashed line. And from all that, again, we can work out again, sort of how much strength do these observers give to sort of redness and greenness versus blue and yellow. So there's no difference in the overall amplitude for blue and yellow. And as a group, the anomalous observers are weaker than the color normal observers. So they're not showing as much red and green response, yet they're substantially stronger than you predict from their threshold losses. So again, this is consistent with the study of BAME et al. and showing a partial but pretty strong compensation. Uh, one other thing we've tried to do with this is really try to start looking at sort of the um, representation of color within um, anomalous observers and how that relates to color normal observers. So in previous work, my graduate student Kara Emery's done a lot look using these hue scaling functions and individual differences in color normal observers to try to work out sort of what are the underlying sources of variation in those. 
And we wanted to do similar things with these anomalous observers. And if you just look at the correlations between the hue scaling responses across different stimulus angles, you see for color normal observers, it's only nearby stimuli that are actually correlated. So that suggests actually that the individual differences really depend on fairly narrowly tuned processes like how you respond to an orange color is actually independent of how two observers are responding to red or yellow, whereas we're seeing much stronger correlations in the anomalous observers. And I should say this is based on a very small sample. So the this analysis itself is quite noisy and I wouldn't give a whole lot of weight to it yet. Um, but even with this, um, we are starting to see this pattern emerging where the factors we get are very different for the anomalous observers and also accounts for much more of the variance. And I think that's just because the variations in the hue scaling functions across the anomalous observers are much larger. And as a result, um, when we're looking at the um, factors that are involved in their differences, they really have more, I think, to do with sort of the nature of their compensations. Whereas when we're looking at the normal trichromats, I think it's telling us more directly about the nature of how colors coded. Um, and just one example of this, this is a factor for the anomalous observers, which seems to correspond roughly to how much weight the individual is giving either to redness versus greenness um, in the um, hue scaling. And it's something we don't see in the case of um, the normal uh, population. Uh, so I guess I'm already running late on time. But um, the point I want to make about this is that what this suggests is, again, this is consistent with very many studies that have shown partial but very strong compensation. But again, in a task like this, you don't really know is this happening, um, at what level this is happening. It could just be that these anomalous observers have learned to describe color in the same way, even though the sensory signals are basing that on are very different. So to try to look at that, we've also tried to look at whether we can see physiological evidence for a compensation. So this is work that was done by my former graduate student, Katie Tregelis, um, and it's a real credit to her that she did this fMRI study in spite of the fact that I don't do that. And um, so it's really entirely her credit. And I also wanna mention Zoe Isherwood was really helpful with some additional analyses. Uh, but the idea of this is we just basically measured the contrast response function in early visual areas to different um, levels of LM or S contrast, and then asked how that compares between normal observers shown in gray and um, a, no a set of anomalous observers here shown in red. And we could basically fit a contrast response function to each of those and then ask, is the response of the anomalous observer stronger than we'd expect from their threshold losses, which is again shown by the dash curve here. And what we found in fact, um, somewhat surprisingly, is that if you looked at the responses at V1, in fact, the anomalous observers weren't really doing much better than you'd expect from their threshold losses. But by the time we got to V2 or V3, they were indistinguishable from the color normals. And this persisted even when we um, used a potentially demanding task to try to rule out the possibility of uh, top-down feedback. So this um, is a case, and as far as I know, surprisingly, this is the first case where people have actually used fMRI to look at color coding. Um, in anomalous observers. Um, but what it suggests, in fact, is that this, um, these response changes, we do see clear signs of them. They seem to be happening in early visual cortex and possibly as early as V1, but likely not earlier than that because we don't seem to be seeing anything inherited from earlier stages into V1. Okay, the next um, question I'd like to look at is how these long-term gain changes are related to the short-term gain changes that we typically study in things like um, contrast adaptation. And one way to look at this is instead of just studying natural color deficient observers, we could do things like we could take a color normal observer and suddenly reduce their color sensitivity, see how they adapt. Or we could take an anomalous observer and suddenly enhance their color vision. And there's a really beautiful study by Myung Kwan several years ago where she just had people wearing contrast reducing goggles for just four hours. And just in that brief amount of time, she was actually able to show that if you were living in this reduced luminance contrast world, then over time you became more sensitive to luminance contrast and you started seeing increases in the bold response. 
And we try, have tried to do similar sorts of things for color. So this is one experiment where we basically had people adapt either to a uniform color distribution or one that was filtered to simulate an anomalous trichromacy. And you do get the kind of expected adaptation effect. So if you're adapted to this pattern versus this one, then you start to notice the reds and greens more. But what we found, in fact, this is sort of a couple hours adaptation at most, that these were really just sensitivity losses. We didn't actually see a sensitivity enhancement. And so we wanted to go for slightly longer times. And so what we did was basically try to use um, these glasses called Varianter glasses, which simulate a dichromacy. And the idea would be to wear those for several hours and then see if you could suddenly start to see enhancements in color over time. So these are my postdocs, Daniel and Zoe, and trying them out. And when I saw this picture, I immediately rushed into the lab to make sure they had walked off with my spectroradiometer. But um, they have their thumbs up here because I told them, you know, I want you to adapt to color. So while you're wearing these, you shouldn't be writing papers or programming because then you're just looking at a black and white screen. You should go out and have fun. Or if you're in the lab, watch movies or video games or something. And then I realized they're doing that anyway without the glasses. Um, but <clears throat> anyway, they did try real hard. They adapted sometimes up to 10 hours, I think. And we just, at least over that time, we weren't seeing any change at all. We unfortunately had to make the measurements with the glasses off, um, but even immediately after that, there wasn't any measure that we could make where we could really see an enhancement happening. Um, and so anyway, we've not been able to see these enhancements over fairly short durations. The other way, again, that you could look at this would be to take color anomalous observers and then suddenly give them amplified color signals. And one way that this is being done is using filters like the enchroma glasses, which basically block out certain parts of the spectrum. And with the net effect that you can increase the relative um, contrast of the LNM cone signals. And there's a really nice recent work by Jack Werner and Ken Knobloch and their colleagues showing that if observers just wear anomalous trichromats, wear these glasses for several days, they actually start to become much more, reds and greens to them become much more salient. So this is sort of the opposite of the adaptation effect that you'd expect, um, but it suggests again that you can, there is this really short-term plasticity that you can see in these anomalous observers. And what we by um, actually coincidence had been looking at something kind of similar, which was the effects of wide gamut LED lighting. We weren't interested really in color deficiencies, but just what is the effect when we all are gonna start living under these lights that are really changing the colors of scenes. And I was struck that in fact, the um, so typical wide gamut LED with these three primaries has a very similar transmittance that you actually see to the enchroma glasses. So it has simulating kind of similar effects. And recently we've been just kind of modeling what kind of color enhancements you could get either from these filters or just under the LED lighting. And so these are the um, expansion of the gamut that you predict from the enchroma glasses versus a typical LED light. And you can see that they're fairly similar. And again, for separate reasons, we were interested in what's going to happen when normal trichromats are actually adapting to these um, stronger color signals in their environment because of this richer lighting. And so we've done studies where basically we simulated the same set of surfaces under either a natural broadband illuminant, say, or a um, narrow band illuminant and had people adapt to these often sort of you see one set of surf, a set of surf, same surfaces under one illuminant on the left side and the other illuminant on the right side. And then you could make color matches between them. And the prediction again is that after you've adapted to the white point, if the LEDs are producing a stronger red green contrast, you should see stronger adaptation to them. And in fact, that's what we found. So if we extend that to the anomalous observers, that predicts the potential, at least, if you did actually enhance their um, red, green, or L versus M signals, then it's possible that they will also start adapting to that, and that might offset um, some of the benefits. OK, um, so the conclusion for this point um, is that I 
at least so far, it's not clear. Again, we don't know with these anomalous observers, are they adapting really rapidly and we're just testing it 30 years later? Or is, are we really seeing a process that took 30 years to evolve and might be fundamentally different from the kind of effects we see at short time scales? The last question I wanna look at is the fact that very many people, again, have looked at these compensations and even though they're quite dramatic, they're rarely um, complete. So. Uh, and I actually, um, in my own thinking, I've gotten to the point where it's much more interesting now to say what, what are the limits to the plasticity rather than whether it occurs, because I think that's um, very clear and um, strongly expected. And in principle, again, if you just thought that if you reduce the L versus M signal and you had that available at post-receptoral levels, you could just amplify that again. And this was sort of a model that we had developed on that idea, um, but there's very many reasons why you don't actually have that um, simple situation. There's many things that could corrupt the signals. And um, there's also, um, we know again that this varies across observers. And I think one of the really big mysteries is why that is. So this is a beautiful study by Ben Regan and John Mullen. Um, so Ben was a graduate student when I was a postdoc in Cambridge, and I was really jealous of him because while I was sitting in the lab looking at a monitor, he was in French Guyana studying foraging of New World monkeys. And so that seemed much more fun. And, uh, but it was actually a really harrowing thing. And I remembered one day John came in and told me that Ben had fallen out of a tree with a spectra radiometer on his back. But he said it was okay because he landed on his stomach. Um, but anyway, they did this really nice work where they, um, we're comparing the relative salience of perceptual organization based on LM or S signals. And you can see here that most of these anomalous observers gave much less weight to the LM signals, but some were indistinguishable from normals. So again, I think there's two main questions, sort of what in general limits plasticity, but also why are these look so different across observers? And we're just starting to look at some of the different possibilities. And I think there's many out there that many people have already talked about. One is that when you um, change the cone signals, you're not simply reducing the LM contrast available to a color normal observer. And so it just amplifying that signal isn't going to recover that difference. Many people have also talked about the idea that you might um, be amplifying not only the signal, but also the noise in the system. And so that could affect things like your um, sensitivity. Um, there's also the possibility, um, there's been some nice studies looking at how the visual system learns, whether it's getting an input from an L versus an M cone. And the more similar they are, the harder that is to distinguish. And so you might expect errors and limits just because you're mislabeling what you thought was one cone type as another. And then finally, one thing we're starting to look at is just how do these gain changes really manifest when you consider them within the um, population? Um, so let me skip that. Um, and the idea here is that, um, again, very simplistically, you can think, well, we could just amplify the LM signal. But the problem is that I think at least that that LM signal is really um, multiplexed with many other color dimensions. So for example, if we look even in P cells, they're carrying not only chromatic information, but also luminance information. And there's a really nice study by um, Lutz and Smith and Picorni, I think, where they show that in fact, at the level of the LGN, it doesn't look like the system adapts at all, either in the short term or the long term. So the contrast response of dichromatic monkeys, for example, is similar to um, trichromats. And we also know at higher levels, in fact, that um, we have mechanisms that are tuned to many different combinations of L versus M or S versus LM cones. So the question is, how would you be able to gain, amplify the gain just of the LM uh, within that? And just to show this as kind of a thought experiment, suppose that you thought of the P cells as representing different directions in the luminance chromatic plane, so different cells give different weights to either pure chromatic or pure luminance signals. If you're an anomalous observer, you're going to lose sensitivity to the LM axis because you, and because you can't independently adapt that out, that's going to bias the tuning of most cells away from the LM axis and toward the S axis. If you now let each of these individual cells readapt, so they're gonna adjust their gain back to what they would based on the environmental signals, then each individual cell can recover, but this response of the system as a whole is still biased toward the luminance axis. And then if you predict, well, how much 
extra color information are you going to get out of that? Again, it's going to depend enormously on what the actual distribution is. But here, for example, if you had a, um, say only one fifth as sensitive to the LM as color normal observers, then you could recover about 2.5 fold sensitivity, but that's also because it's happening within this system that's also coding luminance, then it produced about a 40% increase in luminance. And intriguingly, there are studies that um, have found that individuals with color deficiencies actually have higher luminance sensitivity. Um, and one other um, thing I want to mention about that is this whole model is based on the idea that when you're estimating the contrast of the stimulus, like how, what is the LM contrast or the luminance contrast, you're not just basing it on the most sensitive channel, but you're pooling across all of the channels. And so I was worried about that a bit, but then I thought back in the work that I did with John Mullen, uh, many years ago, we were adapting, for example, to an LM variation, and we did find that that produced significant sensitivity losses along the orthogonal directions. And in fact, exactly what you'd expect if your perceived contrast along this direction is not only dependent on this mechanism, which we think wasn't adapted, but pooling, say, mechanisms that are sensitive to uh, both dimensions. Um, so anyway, I want to end on that and say that this model that I had, I now think was much too simplistic and because we really weren't considering how the system is adapting in terms of the actual representation of color. And I'm really excited to be working with Kara and Zoe about that and um, admitting that I'm wrong there. Um, Kara is not surprised, I think, that I got that wrong because I've also been working recently with her on a study looking at um, adaptation and how it's related to Bayesian inference. And I was writing some code on the likelihood function and she found an error in it. And I realized she discovered a new function called the likelihood function, which is the probability that I screwed something up. Um, but anyway, let me end on that note. Um, so I know I'm preaching to the choir again, but um, I just, in my own mind, the more I think about this, the more I just think this is amazing that we have this beautiful natural experiment where we can look at some of these questions and Again, I think they're not only incredibly um, important and valuable and useful for looking at questions about plasticity, but also for looking at a lot, a lot of questions that are still really unresolved about color vision. And when we're doing things like asking people to describe their experience, how do we know, for example, whether they're um, telling us things that are related to the sensory processing are the more kind of um, interpretations of those signals. So I think it's a, still a really rich um, field of study. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions.